loving us as much as you do and giving us this time together, you have set this time apart because you love us. And you have set this time apart because you want to meet with us. And you have given us this chance, Lord, to hear your voice and to sense your heart and to determine your will for our lives. Be glorified in this time. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Turn your Bibles there. If you need help, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. If you're in Revelation, you've gone way too far. So first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be looking at the first few verses. And I'm just going to start right out and talk about the Chronicles of Narnia. And C.S. Lewis's children's story, really a lot for adults there. So don't dismiss it as merely... um, you know, a a work for children. Narnia is an amazing world that Lewis creates, and and there's so much biblical imagery in the Chronicles of Narnia series. The first book is called The Magician's Nephew, and in it, Lewis presents a picture of creation, and it is perhaps one of the most glorious, one of the most amazing descriptions of creation as executed by the lion Aslan. And as you know, Aslan is a Christ figure in the story of of Narnia. And I'm going to quote Lewis and just give you a picture of creation. He says, In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It seemed to come from all directions at once. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth herself. There were no words. There was hardly even a tune. But it was beyond comprehension and comparison, the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. And after this scene, those present looked above them and saw the blackness filled with stars, and each of them were singing as well. But the voice of the stars grew fainter as the voice of the one singing drew near. Wind came rushing, the blackness of the sky turned to gray, hills began to stand up around them, the sky changed to pink and then to a brilliant gold, and as soon as the voice swelled to the mightiest sound it could produce, the sun rose over the hills. And I'll skip ahead. The song began to change after this, and the lion began walking toward the party standing there. With each step, the singing lion took with its large paws trees and mountains and animals and rivers and flowers and all sorts of lovely things were bursting forth into existence until finally all was created. Narnia had been created by the voice of the lion. And Aslan stood in the center of a circle created by all the animals he had just made And he said to them, Narnia, 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 awake, love, think, speak, be walking trees, be talking beast, be divine waters. And hence it came into existence. Wow. To have been present in Lewis's mind as he wrote these words, but greater yet to be present in those early verses of Genesis. What was it like for something to come out of nothing? What was going in the mind of the great architect as he came up with a plan to put together not just this canvas, but this incredible work of art on the canvas he has created? You ever thought to yourself, How brilliant is the mind of God to create what he's created? And these are just the things we see. What about the unseen realm? I remember doing a a trip to Havasupai. Who's been to Havasupai? Probably one of the greatest experiences of interacting with God's creation I have personally ever have had. It's like walking into the Garden of Eden, literally. But I remember on my first trip to Havasupai years ago, We stopped in the middle of the highway, which is just a two-lane single road going to the the top of the the hilltop as you descend into into the canyon. And we stopped in the middle of the night, and I had never seen a sky filled with so many stars in my life. And I thought to myself, wow, God is awesome. 
And it wasn't like the number of stars, like you would sit there and go, look at all the white dots. There were so many stars. It was almost like, look at all the black specks and a sky so illuminated with God's glory and his grandeur. And yet we're surrounded by creation and all these things are meant to be pointers to a creator. All of what God has done is meant to point to his majesty and his power. And if it elicits within you a heart to worship him, he has done a great work. Genesis 1.1, we go back to the, the early chapters of Genesis as Moses writes to the, to the children of Israel. He invites us into this scene and he wants us to understand not just what has been created, but the creator behind the creation. And so this morning we get to journey uh, into day one of creation. And something that's interesting is that there's six days of creation and then the seventh day God took off because he, he wanted to tell us how valuable rest is. And some of us need to learn that lesson and we'll get there in, in a few weeks. But we're invited into what God has done. Now you need to understand the first three days of creation are different than the, the last three days. See, the first three days of God's creation have to do with forming the second three days have to do with filling what has been formed. And what you need to understand is we look at these texts, as we look at these verses, the Bible is pretty sweet when it comes to scientific evidence for what God has done. But if you're looking to the Bible to be a scientific textbook, you're looking in the wrong place because God doesn't share all the details. But what he does share with us, all those details are corroborated by science. And so what we have to look at is we have to look at a, a universe and a creation and earth that is intentionally designed the way it is and perfectly set up to be inhabited by life, specifically the apex of creation, you and I, human beings, and we give glory to God by looking at what he has created. And so the first point we need to consider this morning is this, that God gives knowledge to his creation. And the knowledge God shares with us comes in two forms. There's natural revelation, and then there's spiritual or special revelation. See, God gives enough in creation to point to the reality that he exists. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare your handiwork, O God. The stars are shouting forth speech. And what is creation declaring? That there is a great designer behind it all. Romans chapter 1 says, in creation we see that God is mighty, he is powerful, he is wise, he is strong. And so we cannot escape the fact that no man, no woman is without excuse. No one could ever come to you and say there is no God. Because natural revelation, what is seen through creation, makes God evident. And that's why some people will say, well, what about the people that never hear of Jesus? What about the people that live in the most remote part of the world and they never get to hear about Jesus? The Bible is clear and says they are without excuse because God has made himself known in what has been created all around them. The problem is this, is when we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Suppressing the truth literally means you are deliberately hiding something you know you should be accountable to, but you don't want to be accountable to it because you like yourself as God better than the true God that exists. Suppress is the, the, the word that's used for a little boy who runs into his house with a puppy in his arms, goes upstairs, opens his toy box, puts it in there because he says, here's his mom coming upstairs. He sits on top of the toy box. The mom says, what's going on? What's in there? He says, nothing, mom. And meanwhile, the dog's trying to pop up out of the toy box. You can't hide, you can't suppress, you can't cover up the fact that God is there. This is why the psalmist says, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. But while natural creation is there to tell us there's a God, natural creation doesn't tell us how God saves a rebellious people. This is where special revelation is key. See, knowledge not only comes through creation, but specifically special or spiritual revelation, the, the, the message of Jesus. No man can be saved. No woman can be saved just by going to the Grand Canyon. 
There's nothing in that experience to tell you that you are a sinner and God is holy and there's a huge chasm that divides the two of you and only Jesus is the one that can give you that relationship with the Father. This is why the message of Christ is so important. That's why Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news to the world. And so why do we talk about this? It's because creation points to a creator. Creation points to the fact that we're accountable to this creator. And just when we think that Genesis is about science and creation and trees and mountains, this is the story of God capturing our hearts so that we can love him. That's why this is important. And so we turn to Genesis and we get to actually bounce into verse two. So we spent two weeks in verse one. We're going to navigate through three verses this morning. I hope God willing, right? And we look at day one of creation. And it says in verse two, and the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, day one. Full, st full stop. What do you think God wants us to discover here this morning? Well, there's three things I want to isolate this morning. Number one is this. God gives order to his creation. Because verse two signifies the fact that things are somewhat maybe out of order. Things are in disorder. Maybe things are chaotic. It says in verse 2, and the earth was formless and void, and there's this darkness that's enveloping the earth. Now, what I want to do is I want to talk physically about what was going on here, and I want to talk about spiritually what's taking place here, and hopefully enhance our understanding of what the world was like, our world, earth, before it was inhabited by any sort of creature, animal, human being, etc. So what we actually know from this verse is that the earth began as this planet that was totally enveloped by ocean. The Bible tells us that this planet, there were no promontories yet of land popping out of the ocean. It was completely enveloped by water. And then there was this darkness that surrounded the earth. And it was a very raw creation. And again, I don't know why God chose to start things the way they, that he did, but all of a sudden you have this orb in space that's completely covered by water and shrouded by darkness, emphasizing the basic material elements that God wanted to start with. And most scientists would tell you, yeah, there was a time when the world was completely covered with water and the atmosphere of the earth was, in their language, opaque, meaning there was such debris and dust in the atmosphere that no light could come through it. It was shrouded with this combination of oxygen and, and water, and it was so dark that the light from outside of the earth could never come to the surface of the waters on the other side of that atmosphere. Well, this is in line with scripture. Write these verses down. This is awesome. Psalm 104, even the psalmist recognized this as he's moved by the Holy Spirit. You covered the earth with the watery depths as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. See, the psalmist is harking in us back to that original creative moment when God brought this orb that we call planet earth our home and says at one point it was completely covered with water peter second peter chapter three he tells us but they deliberately forgot that long ago by god's word the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water see we recognize how much water is an important part of our planet how much of the earth is covered by water? Two-thirds. But at one time, it was 100% enveloped by water. 
No continents rose above the surface of the water and no light reached it. And yet the Bible tells us God sits above the sphere of this planet. Now, here's what, I, here's what concerns me, that there's still people that are part of a flat earther society. You guys, we live in the 21st century, and there's still people that believe that the earth is flat. Can I give you some verses to dispel that right now? Write down these verses. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 24, 27, it says, When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, underlining the the sphere of the earth. How about Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22? He who sits above the circle of the earth, again, emphasizing its sphere shape. Uh, Job 22, verse 14, he walks on the circuit or the circle of heaven, meaning there's this idea that there's a circle uh, shape to the earth. So, So you need to understand that the flat earthers, that's not a group that you want to be a part of, all right? And, and again, what we have from Scripture falls right in line with what scientists have discovered, which is pretty awesome. But what you need to see is this orb that was covered with water and had this opaque atmosphere was formless and void. And God's method is to work from that which is formless to that which is formed. See, there's a spiritual principle here that I think God wants to tell us that even as dark and as disruptive as this early planet was, he is a God who can bring form out of formlessness. That he's a God who can bring order out of disorder. That he's a God who can bring peace and and civility and calm out of that which we would maybe call chaotic. I remember having a pool when we first moved to Arizona. One of my favorite things was to watch the pool being built in our backyard. And we never lived in an environment where there were pools. So having a pool, we were up in North Phoenix. It was like, we we're like the best family on the block at that time, right? We get a pool. And, and I remember learning to go in the pool as a young boy and taking a raft and just bouncing on the raft so that the waves of the pool would just go crazy, Scaring my little brother, scaring my sister, driving my mom bonkers because more water was escaping the pool and I wasn't paying the water bill. And I'm thinking to myself, if, if these young kids were scared of these waves in the pool, I mean, think about what the earth was like when it was chaotic like this. I mean, if you and I were present during God's early creation and forming of the earth, you and I would probably sit there going, this is freaky, This is scary, and yet God is able to step into those chaotic, scary moments and bring peace where there doesn't seem to be peace. And that's a good word for us, you guys. If God does this with physical entities, planets, stars, creation in general, How much more does God want us to know he can step into the chaos in our lives and bring about peace when we don't think there's peace? Amen? How many times do you think God sends the message to us and and says to us what you may see as disorder? Just let me step in and bring order to what you would deem as disordered. God does this. Amen? It reminds me of Michelangelo's uh, sculptures called The Captives. And I don't know if you've ever seen it. I've never seen it in person. But Michelangelo took these blocks of marble and began to carve men and women out of these, these blocks. And halfway through the project, he stopped. Because what he wanted to encapsulate in these, these works of art was these human beings emerging from this lifeless block of marble. So they're half done, yet they're emerging from something that you and I would not see, but the artist's eye, Michelangelo, says, I'm going to bring something out of this, and he called them the captives. And I wonder how many times God's saying, let me chisel away the garbage of your life, and let me set you free from what you deem as non-artistic, or it's not artwork, or the world says you're just dirty, or you're worthless. God says you're valuable. So let me do a work in you. Amen? So here we are. The earth is formless and void, and God steps in and does something miraculous. And this is the third point in your notes. He gives life 
to his creation. And what's remarkable here in verse 2 is that we now have a member of the Trinity called out separately. And what member is that? It's the Spirit. So it says that the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. First time we have a member of the Trinity called out, and it's the Spirit of God. And this is the energizer part of the Trinity that brings life to what God has created. Now, what's remarkable here is that we have to understand that it is the Spirit's job to bring life. We have the Father who speaks things into existence. We have the Son who is the Word, who brings objective truth. But it's the Spirit's role to energize the truth with life. See, you can't just have all truth and no life. You just become rigid and cold and, and legalistic. And you just can't have the spirit without objective truth, right? Because then it becomes just this direction of spiritual journey. We have the word and the spirit. And this is why I think God isolates the spirit here. The spirit is both, write these words down, transcendent and imminent. See, the Spirit is that third member of the Trinity that is beyond us, yet in control of our lives, applying salvation to our souls and guiding us in the, in the path we should go. But the Spirit is also eminent, intimately involved in every little detail of our experience. See, we have to understand that this idea of transcendence and, and eminence is something that is so near and dear to the heart of God as he relates with us. He's not a God who is so distant that he can't relate with us, but he is a God who is also up close and intimately connected with our lives. So we have the early orb of earth surrounded by water, this dark, opaque atmosphere around it, and the Bible says the Spirit is there hovering or moving. Can I give you better words? Write these down in your Bible, and you won't go to hell for writing your Bible, I promise, okay? Write down these words. The Spirit is fluttering. The Spirit is vibrating. Now, I want you to see how remarkable this is. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, God gives us this revelation and says, the Spirit is doing what science has been telling us the, 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 the world, how the world operates, specifically with gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. Can, can I tell you, I was on NASA's website two days ago. This is why you guys pay me to be a pastor. I get to hang out with the NASA geeks, right? And on the NASA website, they talked about how there are two major prominent, dominant forces at work in the world because when all is said and done, two energies are at work. Gravitational energy and electromagnetic energy. And each of those energies comes to us, operates around us in a wave-like fashion. The spirit is vibrating. The spirit is fluttering. God is bringing energy to his creation. He's applying life to the canvas. And this is what the spirit does. Now, while the scientists may not understand the connection between the waves and the spirit, God does not want us this morning to miss this. What we would just deem as scientific Ad, you know, advancement and discoveries, God wants us to be clear. The force behind every light wave, every heat wave, every sound wave, you name the wave, it falls under two categories, gravity and electromagneticism. It comes from God. And the spirit, the one who vibrates, is the energizer behind it all. You guys didn't know you are going to be at Science 101 today, did you? This is remarkable. 
scientists cannot explain it. They can capture it. They can analyze it. But ultimately, they don't know ultimately where these things come from. And yet God tells us, here is the spirit vibrating, fluttering over the earth. You see what, what's going on here? The spirit is bringing the gravitational waves and the electro, uh, electromagnetic waves to bring more form to that which was formless. Look at the end of verse 2. And here's the spirit moving over the surface of the waters. The only other time this idea is even used in scriptures in Deuteronomy 32, where the idea is a mother bird fluttering above her nest of little babies. Meaning the spirit is not only producing a physical energy to bring these things into more cohesion, the spirit is also there to protect. The, the spirit is there to incite life. The spirit is there to to stir up that which was stagnant. And I sit there and go, what an amazing theology of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit protects us in Christ. Amen? The Spirit stirs up life where there existed no prior life. Amen? The Spirit is there to remind us that God has this mothering aspect of his love towards us where he says, you're my kids, and I'm going to be like a mama bear, and I'm going to protect you from all harm, from all hurt, from all damage. This is remarkable. So he gives life to his creation. He interacts with it. He interrelates with it. So you got the father, who's the architect. You got the son, who is this revealer of things, bringing, the, bringing all these things into, into being. Colossians 1, right? Through him and him are all things. Now you have the spirit who energizes it all. Can I just write, write down these words real quick? So you don't miss, and I don't want you to divorce in your mind what's going on in Genesis 1-2 and in, in your life today. The Spirit always sustains life. Write down that word, sustains. The Spirit always causes growth. The Spirit always quickens that which is stagnant, lifeless, or dead. Too many churches do a wonderful job of emphasizing God the Father and God the Son. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, and no wonder, King James people, the Holy Ghost, that's freaky. We're like, well, I don't want to have anything to do with ghosts, right? What you have to understand is the Spirit is that mother aspect of God that draws near to us and says, I will take care of you. I will sustain you. I will cause you to grow. And I will quicken that which is not happening. I will bring forth life. And he does this in concert with the word. And this is why we bring feelings to our beliefs. We're not just sitting here in a seminary class. This is not an academic environment. As much as I love diving into this stuff, I want you to know that if we just look at this with our heads and divorce our hearts from it, this is not honoring to God. I want the spirit to flutter and vibrate in our hearts to show us how remarkable God is. And so the spirit is moving. And you know where the spirit is, Paul says, there is freedom. I, I never want your spiritual life in Christ to become a mental academic exercise. We invite the spirit in to flutter and vibrate. Add that to your prayers, right? Like start praying, you know, spirit vibrate in my heart. People are like, what, what are you talking about? Flutter about, right? Like, but this idea, just the, the, is there a reason why the spirit descended as a dove? Right when Jesus is baptized, Matthew 3, wow, now it's all coming together. And you have this, this, this whipping motion of the wings of this bird. And boy, now you picture that in, in, with your spiritual eyes and go, stir, flutter, vibrate, bring life where there is no life. Bring order to where there's disorder. This is what the Spirit's doing in creation. Think about how much more he's doing in us if we allow him that opportunity. So 
all these operating forces, gravity and the electromagnetic spectrum are crucial to our physical universe, and yet God is behind it all. So spirit is transcendent, freedom over it, protecting it, and yet he's eminent, intimately involved with it. Last point. So the spirit is bringing life, right? So God causes life to happen to his creation. The last point is this. God gives light to his creation. Where there is no light, there is no life. John chapter 1. John wants us to know that, uh, not this verse, but, um, but it is John, but it's not the verse I'm referring to. So thanks, tech guys. Give it up for the tech guys, all right? John chapter 1. John deliberately connects us with the word Jesus and that light and life is ultimately found in him. Okay? Where there is no light, there is no life. This is why God created on day one, light. Look at verse three. And God said, let there be light. The first words of God recorded in the Bible. Let there be light. He sends forth light. Now, okay, stop. Because I know probably some of you are thinking, how does God send forth light when it isn't until day four he creates the sun and the moon? Gotcha! Bible's false. It's full of contradictions. What we have to understand is that while we may have the physical light of the sun, there's a greater light that exists beyond the sun, okay? What you have to understand is the Bible is clear when we go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, which is the verse on the screen. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Not only that, but Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 12, reminds us that he is the light of the world, and whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So the imagery is very deliberate. God says in his first word spoken, let there be light. He wants you to understand something about his character, his essence. We're not saying light is God. That is called pantheism, and we don't worship light. But we worship the one who has declared that part of his essence is light. And we ought to be thankful because if there's no light, there's no life. God says, let there be light. And there is light. So what you need to understand first and foremost, God is the ultimate source of life. And in early earth, as he's forming it, he takes the opaque atmosphere where no light was penetrating it and the earth was dark and he turns the opaque atmosphere into something translucent, removes the debris, removes the dirt and allows light to now hit the planet. Let there be light. Boom. It happens. Now, before we scoot on too far and dig deeper into this, I want you to know something. There is something powerful about God speaking. You need to stop and consider the word. You know, we have this commercial, and I'm probably dating myself. When E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. Well, you need to consider the power of God's word. That God's word is both legislative and God's word is also executive. Meaning, legislative, his word is the law. His word is his word, and he gives it to us 
not just as divine suggestions, not just a fatherly opinion, not just as good advice, but he gives it to us because his word is legislative. It is by his word all things come into being. It is by his word all things exist. It is by his word that all things hold together. Therefore, his word is not just legislative. It is executive. It is irresistible. And it ought to have that irresistible power on our lives. When God speaks, everyone should listen, but we don't. See, we have to recognize that when God speaks, speaks, creation follows the speech. It does what it's told to do. God says, let there be light. Boom, it does it. God says, let there be this. Boom, it does it. And yet there's this uncanny relationship God has with us as human beings. When God tells us to do something, we don't do it. And that is a dangerous place to be. If you love God, and you have come to love God through the love that Jesus has for you, and the Spirit is residing in your life, you understand not just the importance of God's word as it comes to you, you understand the importance of obedience to that word, the responsibility you have, the fact that we are all held accountable to his word. And this is why we as a, as a, as a church community put a premium on the word of God. Because we want not only to understand its legislative powers over our lives, we want to understand the executive powers that God says, I do not want you to take time and consider it. I want you to do quick obedience to it. This is why the psalmist in Psalm 119 says, it is your word that is a lamp to my feet. Word and light, there's a relationship there. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me and walks with me does not walk in darkness. See, God is establishing a principle here where he says, I have given you light. And as much as I want you to appreciate physical light, I mean, I'm glad the lights are on right now. And even if the lights were on, we would still have daylight. But to be in a room with you where there's no daylight and it's darkness, that's scary. So we thank God for light, right? We thank God for light when our car breaks down in a seedy part of town and we don't know where we're at. We don't know, you know, our phone is basically 1% charge left on it and we're going, I'm freaking out a little bit right now. I wish it was daytime and I wish it was in the middle of the night. My first question is, why are you in a seedy part of town in the middle of the night? But you know what I mean? We've, I think we've been in situations where we thought I could really use some light right now. I've gone spelunking. You know what spelunking is? Spelunking is going into deep, dark caves inside of mountains. And it is dark. I mean, you put your hand in front of your face and you can't see it if you don't have light. And it's amazing how quickly you can enter the cave going into the caverns and how quickly light is dispersed and dispelled and gone. So God, from the beginning, says, let there be light. Because he not only wants us to be amazed by what is physical light, he also wants us to understand the importance of spiritual light. But there's also an in-between point. So let's talk about the light. Three types of light exist in our world. There's physical light. There's knowledge light. And there's spiritual light. Let me explain this real quick. So, there's physical light, like I just described. We're all thankful for, you know, being, you know, coming into the house at night and, uh, you know, turn on the lights to make sure we know where we're going because when you don't have a light, it is easy to stub your toe on things. And I stub my toe re- routinely. You would think 47 years on this planet, I'd know where to navigate, and I just hit the edge of the bed, I hit the corner of the wall, and you know the pain it feels by stubbing your toe. Amen? So we're thankful for physical light, which God has created. Allowing those, those, those atoms to function as they do, science still can't explain physical light. They can tell you how electrons bounce within a, a, an atom and produce light, but they can't tell you where it comes from. Well, we're, we're, we're talking about that this morning. We know where it comes from, right? There's a God who says, I want to give you physical light. But not only that, there's a knowledge light. 
which is where, you know, you're sitting there and you're working on some problem and you invite somebody to come over and you ever use this phrase, can you shed a little light on this problem? You ever been there in that spot where you're just, you're working through some riddle, you're working through something and say, can you help me understand? So there's this aspect of light being moral understanding. But the ultimate sense of light that God wants his people to understand is the spiritual light. The light that is descriptive of God's very nature itself. The fact that Jesus would equate himself with light. That the scripture is replete with verses of how important it is to be men and women who walk in the light. So the light is a very apt metaphor of the spiritual journey God has called us to live in. And then this is why he says, now I'm going to do something very interesting with the light. I'm going to bring forth separation. So that you now live in a world where there is separate light and separate darkness. And the light I'm going to call day and the darkness I'm going to call night, day one. This is what's called the principle of separation. Where God, before sun and moon and stars were ever created, he allowed the planet to be invaded by light, the light of God himself, to bombard this planet that was being formed out of formlessness, and now he brings forth this aspect where there will be aspects of the planet that get hit by light, and there will be times when it's not hit by light, implying now the earth is on a rotation. So now we have light, and now we have darkness. Aren't you glad there's not light all the time? Because I like to get sleep. Aren't you glad there's not darkness all the time? Because I like to be awake. And when it comes to the creation of man, especially, and we'll talk about this when we talk about men and women being created. There's this thing called the pineal gland that when light hits it, it releases serotonin and makes you wake up. And when light hits the pineal gland, it releases, uh, when light doesn't hit it, it releases melatonin and relaxes you so you can go to sleep. This is why when you sleep, at, you know, sleep during the day and work at a graveyard shift, I did this in the hotel industry for two years. It was the hardest thing to do because that's not the way God had created us. He has created us to sleep at night and be awake during the day. And light is an important aspect of it. So is darkness. But he wants us to understand day one, he is the source of light. And notice what he says about light. And the light was good. God being the creator of everything has the right to label something good and something not good. Notice he doesn't call the darkness good. He calls the light good. Because now this will be an operating principle throughout the scriptures of how important it is for us to be as his kids, to be people that walk in the light and not in the darkness. There is now a principle of separation that exists in our lives where we call things good and there are other things that are not good. This is why there are things called principles and there are things called values and there are things called convictions. And we do our best as God's people to walk in the things that he has deemed good. Why? Because he is light. And if you dwell within him, there is no darkness at all. And this will be the story for eternity. Because I don't want you to miss this. As significant as light is in these opening verses of Genesis, go to Revelation 22, verse 5, up on the screen. It says this. One day there will be no more let night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and It's like God bookends the divine drama with reminding you of one essential aspect of his nature, that he is a God of light. And in him, there's no darkness. 
that we will not have the need of physical light or even the knowledge light, the moral understanding that if we live in him, he will be that all-encompassing light we need. And with his light, he brings security, he brings safety, he brings peace, he brings goodness. So why wouldn't we learn to now to walk in him so that one day we'll understand our ultimate eternal experience of what it's going to be like with him? Amen? Day one. Good stuff? Yeah, you better believe it. So next week, day two, maybe day three, I think we'll get into the, that territory. But in the meantime, this will be an interesting encouragement for you as a church. This week, allow the Spirit to vibrate in your life. Allow the Holy Spirit to not just hover over your spirit, but to stir up within you the things that God has deemed good. Allow the Word to come under the Spirit's control and allow the, the Spirit to energize the Word that you're feeding your soul. How's that? Is that good? I think so. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you are amazing. You are amazing what you have created. And, and we can barely even scratch the surface of, of understanding how things came into being that were never in existence to begin with. And yet, Father, as much as we are floored by what we don't understand with creation, may we be ever more floored by how awesome and amazing you are. And that not only you have set this earth in the condition it is, in the universe, in the situation it's in, and, and yet you have deemed us to be observers and participants and to be awe, be in awe of what you've done. So, Father, thank you for making that, that experience possible because of Jesus. Thank you for exciting it by your Spirit. Be glorified in our lives and allow us a deeper experience with you as we not only marvel at what is seen, but as we marvel at your truth that is revealed through your Word. Thanks for loving us in Christ, for giving us today. You're awesome, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great week, all right? See you soon.